And a British man nicknamed Hardest Geezer has become the first person to run the length of Africa. Russell Cook from Worthing in West Sussex crossed the finish line in Tunisia today. He ran through 16 countries in 352 days. The 27-year-old said he'd struggled with mental health, gambling and drinking and he said he wanted to make a difference. Well, he raised over £600,000 for charity. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's back to Free Speech Nation. Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. So we've got a brilliant studio audience here. Let's not let them go to waste. Let's get some questions. First one comes from Peter. Hi, Peter. Hi. Hi, Hi. again. Uh, was it correct that schools were kept shut down uh, during the pandemic? Yeah, I, I know that the National Education Union this week had their little conference and they said they were proud that they saved lives by ensuring that schools got shut. Did that save lives and was it a good thing for the kids? You're a teacher, right? Yeah, uh, no, I definitely don't think it was a good thing for the kids. Um, and no matter what, some schools were kept open for like children of NHS staff and that. So no matter what, some kids were still having to go to school. Yes. And I certainly don't think we should have had them shot for as long. No, I mean, it's, it's interesting because I used to be a teacher as well. So and you and I know that once kids fall behind a little bit, actually, it, it has a knock-on effect and it's very, very difficult. There seems to be a whole generation of kids who are uh, who are basically behind now as a result of this. And Cressida, the thing that gets me about all of this is that we always knew, always knew right from the start, that this virus didn't affect children. Absolutely. I think I can't really believe we're having to ask this. I think yeah. it's outrageous that this organisation, they've congratulated themselves. Yeah, said, didn't we do well? Didn't we save all these lives? How dare you? You've changed these kids' outcomes for the rest of their lives, probably. Yeah. Maybe some kids can get a choose but the worst affected kids will continue to be the worst. The National Education Union has really become a major activist body in the guise of a teaching union. I mean, they are caught out on all sorts of issues like this. I mean, really, isn't it time that we just ditch them? There are better unions. I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, I, I think it's infuriating. Well, I wasn't with them when I was a teacher. Go on, Paul. And I've never been a teacher. You'll be no. pleased to know. Good. Uh... No, sorry, I don't mean... I mean... <laughs> I just, I just, I don't think it's your skill set. <laughs> no, probably not. No, no, no. no. I could teach little piglets to do things. Yes, but, uh, yes, you could. Uh, Look, it would, quite clearly they were the, they were likely to be the least effective of, affected of society yeah. at that point in time. Of course, there's a lot of hindsight now that some of us, including myself, back in March 2020, were worried about it. Um, and my daughter was taken out of school, and it seemed like the right thing to do, maybe for a couple of weeks. Well, we didn't know. To be fair, this was a new virus. We didn't know all of the ins and outs. But I think really from the start, we did know that kids weren't affected. So what we absolutely knew very quickly is that it was very bad for the kids. It was very bad. Uh, it, it, or the virus? No. Yeah. That the, the, they were kept out of schools. Well, obviously. But we not, knew not that. Not educating children. We knew in that fact, yeah. very, very quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And we knew that the risk uh, was much lower th yes. for them. So we, uh, you know, what I would say is that. They are congratulating themselves because they created the mess. Yes. So they've got to congratulate themselves, because if they don't, they've got to admit they're wrong. Yeah, it just feels like gaslighting, to use yeah, their oh, phrase. Yeah, I think they, they should be running for cover and getting a good lawyer. <laughs> but, um, I, I, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy, isn't it? OK, we're going to move on now to a question from Ian. Where is Ian? I'm here. Hello, Ian. Um, yes, back to the uh, trans issue again, I'm um, Do you think that... Social transitioning, in other words, gender transitioning in schools yeah. is ever going to end. Well, this is an interesting one, Ian, because we've got the CAS review, which uh, we know we've had the interim CAS report, which has already been published for a long time. Uh, the government has been uh, using that to kind of uh, moderate and, gen and generate uh, new guidelines for teachers and for schools, basically, when it comes to children who identify as the opposite sex or as no sex or whatever, whatever it might be. And the CAS review, final CAS review, is going to be published this Wednesday. It looks like the CAS review is going to say... Uh, pretty much what it said before, which was it's not a neutral act. And actually, it can be very psychologically damaging to socially transition a child. In other words, to call the child by the, op the name of the opposite sex and the pronouns of the opposite sex. Because what it does is it locks in psychologically the idea that they actually are the opposite sex. And we know that this is uh, largely a social contagion. Ian, do you have any particular views on this? Do you think, uh, what do you think teachers should do when a child says, I want to be called Maeve or whatever? Well, I, th I would like to see the whole thing come to an end. It seems insane to me just to, for teachers to say to little 
Johnny, yes, you're a little girl now and we'll treat you as such. Yeah, I mean, there's That's a way... That's crazy. There's a way to treat kids sensitively about this stuff, yeah. not to be mean, you know, a way, a way to sort of talk, talk kids through the troubles that they are facing. But we know, Cressida, and I don't mean to have a go at girls, but we know, that the studies show, that teenage girls in particular have a propensity towards social contagion throughout history. Mm -hmm. Falling sicknesses, limping, dancing crazes, yep. uh, you know, the witch hunts in Salem. I'm not blaming you, but what I'm, <laughs> what I'm saying <laughs> is that there is a propensity. You fool, Andrew. And when I was, yes, when I was a teacher, it was, it was eating disorders, and, yes. and before then it was cutting themselves. And so, in, in this case, a lot of kids and a lot of girls are identifying out of being female by saying they're non-binary or saying they're male. Of course they are. It's stressful. You get into puberty and you suddenly faced with a whole load of stuff you didn't have to deal with before. This is why I hated that Costa Coffee advert where Which they showed one? mastectomy scars and the person who was now male uh, was surfing with their eyes closed, looking cool, having a Costa Coffee. And I thought that is so successful because when you're a teenage girl, you feel, you know, you're all confused about your body. You would like to just get rid of it all. And this surfer cool dude thing was, was saying, look, you could just transition. It's no big deal. And yeah, I, I, I spoke to a, a, a female guest on my show about this, actually. And, and one of the things she said is that, you know, it's, it's difficult at that time because you're suddenly getting male attention that you don't want, your body's changing, all of the, these various things. And if you can just make that go away... Exactly. Uh, you know, and a lot of these girls are being told that they will be accepted as gay men within the gay world. And, I, you know, I know a lot of gay people who, who don't go on the gay dating apps like Grindr and things anymore because it's full of women who've been told right. that they're attractive to men. And, of course, gay men aren't interested in them, never will be, because they're gay. Exactly, and so, um, so to answer the original question, if you're setting all that in motion yeah. with small children, that you're just setting up for all these really complicated things to deal with later on. But I don't think the activists are going to let this one go, Paul. I mean, but it is a problem. You know, I've got a teacher friend who contacted me saying, look, the, the, uh, there's a, a child in my class who wants to be called by the opposite sex name and pronouns. Uh, the school has told me that I need to do that, but when I write to the school, to the parents in reports and things, I have to lie and use the other name and pronouns and not tell them. There's a lot of schools that haven't been involving the parents here. This is so multifaceted, this. First of all, I think it's a fad. I really genuinely do. And at some point, we will all see, a lot. everybody collectively, we will see the emperor's got no clothes on and it will just, you know, there will be some acceptance that some kids are trans and some are not and that people are going through lots of changes at that group. The other thing, of course, is it makes no difference to their learning. So, we, we you know, they used to... They used to wear uniforms purely so all kids didn't have to worry about what they looked like. Mm. They all had the same on. It looked, it, looked, it looked neat and tidy outside. And when you were inside, it didn't matter if you were poor, wealthy, if you were Golo trainers like me or Nike Air Max like the rich kid down the road. It didn't matter. So whilst we're just reintroducing stuff by the back door, and I, I'm really uncomfortable with it. I mean, we all pretended to be things as a kid. I remember, I think, you know, I told the teacher I was Superman. He was like, get down, mate. Yeah. Carry on with your maths. Yeah, yeah, OK, well, that would be one approach. And certainly the, the, the categorisation of non-binary is one that's really common as well now. And, of course, oh. uh, well, your reaction there, Cressida, I, says it all. I just I think, who are these people that think that you're 100% female? I mean, aren't we all... We've all got... I don't, well, I think what non-binary, the identification of non-binary is doing is actually reinforcing sex stereotypes. Exactly. Because what you're saying is, I see the world as you've got to behave like this if yep. you're male and this if you're female, so I don't do either. Yep. But none of us do either. So aren't we well, all non-binary? Well, no, of course we're not, though, are we, Andrew? Because no, we're, we're male or female. Male or female. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's so ridiculous that it's hard to, to begin to explain it. I also think it's particularly nasty to have the children being split between one truth at home and one truth at school. I yeah, I think yeah. That's, that's a big problem. That's it's, very interesting. Um, we're going to come back to this issue, no doubt, again and again, but we've got another question now coming from Sarah. Which one? Who's Sarah? Hi, Sarah. Hi. Is it necessary for Bambi to be remade as a horror movie? Do, right, Sarah, are you a fan of Bambi? I remember being traumatised <laughs> as a child. So, so you were, you were traumatised already, yeah. so why not turn it into a horror film? Well, what, what are they going to do? Give them... <laughs> make Thumper have rabies or...? <laughs> Actually, that's a <laughs> great idea. <laughs> are, you, are you one Sarah, of the writers? Sorry, that's a great <laughs> idea. That Stephen King would pay money for that. <laughs> that's brilliant. This is because uh, a new film version of Bambi is called Bambi the Reckoning. <laughs> and it's been made... And uh, we've actually got a package of it. Let's have a look. You ever shot a deer? No. Why have you? Yeah. Once. I actually think that looks quite good. 
<laughs> I mean, look, there's something uh, sinister and horrific about a lot of old fairy tales and kids' stories, and I think some of them are, are the best when they're like, like we talked about Roald Dahl earlier. Yeah. There's that, there's um, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe with that creepy paedophile fawn thing. Yes, yes. <laughs> so you know. But I don't think this is aimed at children, Andrew. Oh, That's isn't a it? Crucial difference. No, I think it should be aimed at children. I think, <laughs> should see I think it definitely isn't. I've never seen Bambi because I've heard what happens, and I don't need to think about that. Yeah. Uh, so this might be less traumatizing, uh, but definitely for adults. I think. Do you think? I mean, I, like Little Red Riding Hood to me always seemed pretty traumatic. Well, all Hansel and Gretel was traumatic, wasn't it? Yeah. They, they, it was all supposed to be terrifying. Yes. It, it, Doesn't the wolf eat her grandmother? Yeah. I mean, that's not nice. No, but in the picture book, it looks lovely, doesn't it? Because the wolf's all cuddly. Yeah. And grandmother looks quite happy as she's been munched to death. Yeah. <laughs> Look, it doesn't really matter, does it? At the end of the day, if no. they remake, if they remake, what was it called again? Bambi, Bambi the Reckoning. Bambi, Bambi, Bambi the Reckoning. Yeah, smashing. I might even go and see that. Yeah, I def I'm going to see that. I'm going to see it. 100%. That's right up my street. <laughs> okay, we're going to move on now to another question. This is from Simon. <laughs> Simon, hello. Hi. Uh, I don't have a particular opinion on this one. I just heard something hot off the press about. There's some in Brazil, the free speech being threatened. Oh, yeah, because, oh, this is a Twitter spat between uh, Brazil... I say a spat, actually, it's quite serious. Mm. Um, uh, so Twitter, uh, well, the Brazilian government, uh, the Brazilian court, has basically ruled and said that certain accounts, certain popular accounts in Brazil on Twitter, sorry, X, have to be blocked by Elon Musk, uh, and they've just said, you have to do that, uh, otherwise we'll just ban your site. And Elon Musk has said, no. I'm not going to do that, even if it means that it's going to be completely shut down uh, in Brazil. Um, so this was reported... To, I saw this video by uh, Michael Schellenberger, who was reporting on this issue, and I hadn't realised this was happening. Um, Cressida, what do you make of this? As usual, Elon's a legend. Um, he's just <laughs> said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to capitulate to this at all. I'm going to lose money over it. It's not right. Freedom of speech matters. I mean, there's various countries. I mean, China has various, you know, extra uh, firewalls and things, you know, they manipulate the internet and that kind of thing. It is good, I think, that, that Elon Musk is saying, no, we will ra I'd rather lose money and revenue for the principle of free speech. I think that's really Yeah, impressive. it's great. And it's not making their leader look good at all, is it? I mean, that's the no. worst press you what, could have. What do you think, Paul? He's got his own version of philanthropy now, hasn't he, Elon Musk? A lot of, a lot of people get their billions, a lot of people, like there's four <laughs> of them, aren't there? Cresta uh, uh, and I are included in that. Yeah, it's, it's you two, Elon Musk and Enya, basically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Enya, did you say? Yeah, she's got a castle in Dublin. <laughs> she's got to be rich. <laughs> OK, yeah, sorry, yeah. How, how could I forget? Uh, so he's, he's created this philanthropy now where he's not necessarily giving to charity, but he's giving back to society. Yeah. He's saying, look, he's bought... He bought he, he bought a Twitter. Uh, a huge loss. But he didn't care for... He knew straight away he would. He's yeah. not a stupid guy. He knew... that That's not a way to make money. You know, w what he decided to do was, I'm going... This is going to be one of the hugest platforms available to humans on planet Earth. Yeah. Because there's humans elsewhere. And <laughs> as a result, I'm going to make sure it stays free speech within reason. And, and it wasn't for a long time. You know, the people that ran Twitter, they, they were colluding with various government factions to censor certain political speech. I mean, it was... There was dodgy stuff going on there, you know, so I think he's, he's made a difference. He certainly has, and this is just another stand. And who are people... To, who, the, who are the arbiters? Who chooses what can and can't be said? Yeah. At the moment, it feels like Hamza Youssef and some bloke in Brazil. Yeah. What Elon is saying is, no, it shouldn't be either of those two people. We should all decide as a community. And, you know, we all know what's right and wrong, and we can debate it. That's the only way you ever get through anything. You, you need to hear some of those things out loud. Otherwise, yeah. they're just going to go elsewhere. Absolutely. OK, well, uh, you're preaching to the converted with me, Paul, but we are going to move on now to another question. This is from Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Um, should, <laughs> should offenders from uh, difficult backgrounds get lighter sentences? Yeah, thank you, Andrew, for that. Actually, Andrew's a great name. I have to <laughs> that. Fantastic yeah, name, it's... although it's not maybe as popular at the moment. No, it's not, but it comes from the, the Greek for manly. So you, you and I, right. you well, can tell. <laughs> yeah. There's no doubt about it. No doubt about it. We, we, we are pretty hench. <laughs> Andrew, I know what this is about. So this is about these, basically, the Sentencing Council, which sets the guidelines for judges and magistrates, and they've said there need to be mitigating factors should someone come to court and they've, they've basically come from a, uh, a bad... They're badly educated. Maybe they grew up with, in a, a, a drug addict family. They've grown up poor. So in, that should be reflected in the sentencing. Andrew, do you think... I mean, there's a risk here, isn't there, that basically they're patronising poorer people and saying, well, you, you're bound to commit crime, so we're going to have to be a bit more lenient. Or am I wrong about that? You're never wrong, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, that... but, of course, as someone said years ago, a crime is a crime is a crime. Yes. So...
No, that's right. I mean, Cressida, do you think it's patronising to working class people? Yeah, I do. Uh, I'm so, I mean, we're assuming that the crime's the same. I, I thought there was already an element of sort of how do you present in court. Um, a, a friend of my dad's was a rugby coach when my brother was a kid and he got... He got so many points on his licence, they were going to take it away. And when yeah. he turned up in court, he said, oh, you can't do that. All these lads rely on me. And he kind of... We thought that he got a lesser uh, sentence anyway because of that, because he was pleading his case that he shouldn't be sent away. Mm -hmm. But this is slightly different, isn't it? Because they're saying, we feel sorry for you. Yeah, it's a bit like that, isn't it? I mean, like, I, I get the point. I mean, the point, Paul, is that, you know, if you come from a deprived background, statistically, you are more likely to end up in, in criminality. Mm. But shouldn't we be holding everyone to the same standards? I'm, I'm from a poorer background and I didn't take the route of crime. I did end up on GB News. You did. And, uh, yeah. and you've stolen some of the mugs from I've, the kitchen. Yeah, but only because I needed to sell them to feed my children. Well, I'm sorry. No, you should get them out there. We've working. had this chat in private, yeah, Andrew. But, uh, look, it, of course, it's very, it's very patronising. Cresta really, you know, hit, hit on a thing there, where it's, if it's an equal crime, if I... Not me, because I'm no longer working class, of course, I'm aspirational. I'm upper working class yes, now. Yes, yes, yes. But uh, um, <laughs> this is a serious well, programme. Yeah. Uh, but if, <laughs> if two people have committed exactly the same crime yeah. and one of them happens to be from an affluent background, are they going to get uh, uh, more of a sentence than the working class? Because criminals are going to be clever, you know. They're going to go, they you are. know what? My dad beat me up. I don't think I should be going to prison. That's true. Yeah, it's X Factor. I, I do quite like the idea of, of really rich people getting punished for it. Do just because just, just I'm jealous. Good old neutral Andrew Doyle. <laughs> Brilliant. I didn't mean it. Okay, next up on Free Speech Nation, we've got author and journalist Ella Whelan, who's going to be here to discuss whether the NHS are taking parents for incompetent morons. Please, do not go anywhere. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Offline and overlooked. That's what Age UK say millions of British pensioners are. Why? Because they cannot or won't access the internet. It's leading to digital exclusion. So the charities campaigning for public services like banks, utilities and even the NHS to maintain a more human approach. Everything's online. People assume you've got a smartphone with a, with a mobile number and uh, an email and without that you don't exist in this world anymore. We've got to try and get the government to see that it's so important to make people feel that they belong because there's a, there's a feeling that the older generation just feel that they're forgotten, they're in the way, and we already know that anyway, but it's just another reason for them to feel that they're not wanted. They'll just accept it and they'll say, well, that's it, I can't do it anymore. And that's it, whereas other people would be really kicking and screaming. So we need to be the voice for older people. Despite digital technology playing an increasing role in our lives, around one in five over 65s in the UK don't use the internet. Thornycroft Centre in Pontefract, West Yorkshire, provides a space for this age group to socialise and get help to go online. I'm not that good with mobiles, so when you mention anything about online, I ain't a clue what you're talking about. The closure of thousands of banks is also detrimental to the older generation. A lot of our members what come, they tend to use cash. Um, they don't like to use bank cards. I think a lot of it's trust or the lack of knowledge. They don't understand how it works. I think they're very vulnerable as well with online. It's really important that they're aware how to use it and how to use it safely. So, in an online era, it's still crucial for many to have an offline option. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
On Mark Dolan tonight, in my big opinion, a Labour government is coming, but no one seems to be celebrating. It's a case of be careful what you wish for. Are the Conservatives now too left-wing? And in my take at 10, Angela Rayner and the political scandal that won't go away. Plus, as they celebrate 19 years of marriage, I'll reflect on Charles and Camilla's great romance with King Charles' biographer Robert Hardman. We're live at 9. to Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. So, does the NHS now think that mothers and fathers are now incapable of raising children without a steady stream of apps and poster campaigns to guide them? That seems to be the assumption behind the new If They Could Tell You campaign, designed with the laudable intention of supporting parents to help build secure bonds to help nurture their baby's future mental health. But which can give the worrying impression that not following the advice to the letter could lead to your child having mental illnesses. Well, joining me to discuss this, I have the author, journalist and mother of a toddler herself, Ella Whelan. <laughs> Ella, it sounds very benevolent, this campaign. So do you want to tell us what's wrong with it? Well, yeah, good intentions uh, are one thing, but I think this actually, it's not benevolent. Um, these sort of, it's, if anyone remembers the Start for Life campaign, the government campaign with those really horrendously irritating plasticine people telling you to, that you're too fat and that you, you <laughs> change your life, um, it's a campaign under that umbrella. And right. it's, it's uh, the government announcement is all about the idea that unless you are giving direct attention to your baby, um, 24-7, um, then they will, they will develop mental health issues later in life. Um, it's the most astonishing amount of sort of psychobabble well, What's the quackery. evidence for that? I mean, what are they basing that on? I mean, <laughs> I, 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 there isn't any credible evidence for it, number one. Um, but I suppose there's a correlation being drawn between uh, an increase in reporting of mental health issues in adults that we see now, which, mm. you know, is a thing that's happening, and you would, if you were sensible, you would question the accuracy and legitimacy of a lot of those claims. But there's a real kind of mummy-didn't-love-me attitude going on where the ills that people are facing today are being blamed on parenting styles. So, for example, there's this one poster that says, um, sometimes I just really need a hug of a lovely little boy. And <laughs> it's telling you, you horrible, <laughs> awful mother, um, to hug your child because, you know, because you wouldn't know to if the NHS didn't tell you. Right. And, um, the <laughs> <laughs> and there's two really bad things going on there. Number one, you know, if you are actually being a good mother, you can't hug your kid all the time because you've got to, you know, wash the, their soiled clothes and cook their dinner and, yes. you know, do all the things that mean raising a child. But also, <laughs> the bottom line of it says, um, you know, physical contact or something builds brain connections. So you shouldn't hug your kid because you love them and they're lovely. Yes. But you should hug them because it builds brain synapses. So it's this really <laughs> horrible, sterile way of looking at child development or looking at raising children. And, um, and actually, <laughs> it's so insane that the Minister for Health, Andrea Leadsom, did this sort of press release to, to, press release to announce it. And she said, in the 1,001 days from pregnancy, pr pregnancy, like conception, like the minute you have sex, to their second birthday, these are the days in which the future of their mental health will be decided. And that's just utter lunacy. I yes, mean, I mean, that sounds mad. It's completely mad, but it's also a re it's really damaging for parents. It's such a huge amount of pressure to put on, and it's always women, particularly women. Um, you already are crippled by guilt when you, like I'm doing at the moment, drop them off at nursery and they cry at the nursery mm. gates, or you know you you feel like you haven't put your all into <laughs> Peekaboo, which is one of the posters because you're knackered because they've had you half you know up half the night, and then to have this sort of messaging breathing down your neck telling you that there will be consequences unless you do this right. I think it's a terrible amount of pressure being put on parents Can for, I ask for you, no reason. Why is it that, that successive governments seem to think that these campaigns have any effect whatsoever. I mean, we saw in Scotland the hate monster campaign mm. where a puppet lectures you to be nicer to strangers. Mm. But the point is that no one reacts well to this. No one sees that and says, oh, I will, I will change my behaviour. Thank you, government. <laughs> yeah. When has that ever happened? Well, well actually, it, it is changing people's behaviour, but not for the better. So I, you know, spend a lot of time in play groups and things like that. And it, they're full of really nervous women who are, because um, again, <laughs> mostly mums, who treat their kids like, um, 
you know, and I mean this in sort of a nice way, but like Tamagotchis. It's like you're terrified about if you're doing the right thing, have, have they had the broccoli today? Have they done the tummy time? Have they done... It's like yeah. tick, 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 tick. And they're not actually raising their kid in a way that, that that's enjoyable for them. So I think it is having a direct effect. But, of course, this current government didn't invent this. This is sort of hangover from New Labour's Sure Start scheme, which was... Right all about a kind of a social engineering project, you know, with a bonus of some childcare, which has been stripped away now, there's hardly any of that left. But a sort of a social engineering project that said, we're going to fix social inequality by making sure that poor parents, the kids of poor parents, get away from home life and mix with some richer kids and hopefully pick up some good habits. And it was a really... It's been a really corrosive intervention into family life. Through that has come, blossomed all these NHS campaigns. And the sort of horrible irony of all of it is that the NHS, to my mind, has no right lecturing parents on how to raise their kids because at the moment, with the maternity scandal, the NHS is failing to bring babies into the world alive um, on a quite astonishing scale at the moment. So, you know, to have, to have that happening and then be sort of finger-wagged by campaigns at, you know, mm. what I'm... The fact that it's the worst, you know, international war crime that I give my toddler a bit of squash is, you know, well, I think that's what really, that's what really kicks us. Well, I was going to ask, because on the basis of what you, you said, um, I imagine these campaigns aren't cheap. Mm. Isn't there something that the government could be doing financially or m spending the money in a better way for new parents? <laughs> yeah, a couple of crashes, you know, a couple of... Some better childcare um, would be just... would alleviate so many family pressures. But also, I think it's, you know, it's not really a policy issue. It, it links to the sort of hate crime monster stuff. It links to the things that are going on in schools with gender ideology. There is this sort of notion that parents left alone to raise their children as they see fit are dangerous and children mm. will come out harmed from that. Um, and parents making decisions, whether it be about religion or ethics or morals or what goes in their plate or how long, you know, how you organise family life... Yes. Um, ..can't happen freely. It has to happen under sort of... with, with a state surveillance. So you mean schools not telling their kids that it's their parents that they've changed gender? Or that yeah. kind of thing, or the or the Scotland's named person scheme, where the yeah. Scottish government tried to assign a guardian, a state guardian, to every child. Yeah, and I mean, you know, it's slightly more controversial, but there was the whole row about the smacking ban, which mm. again, which whatever you think about smacking, most people understand that doesn't really work. Never mind um, it being sort of maybe a bit outdated. But the idea that you would criminalise, you know, you put such a surveillance and criminalise parents on how they raise their kids fez, feeds into this idea mm. that, you know, adults can't be trusted to do the most natural and commonsensical thing, which is raise kids. I mean, even the word parenting I have an issue with because it's turned into this sort of horrendous concept um, that's full of rules and lists and, um, and, and judgment. Not healthy judgment, but sort of corrosive judgment, when in actual fact it's just raising children. And I think we really need to... Parents need to start... <laughs> not quite... I mean, I'm, I'm going to start pulling down the posters <laughs> in my nursery because the, the spaces are so <laughs> sought after. I want to stay in there. But we have to start saying, for God's sake, this is just not helping. And in actual fact, I think it's, you know, the people keep going on about the birth rate being so low and no one wanting to have any kids. I understand why. Because you're not just having a kid and having a nice family and having a nice time. You're, you're embarking on this project of which everyone from the midwife to Andrea Leadsom to um, the NHS local sort of do-gooder is looking at you and watching you doing. And we actually should... I don't want to be kumbaya about this, but, you know, I want to get back to sort of it takes a village to raise a child aspect because children will benefit from this. And I think probably the last thing I want to say is that you look around, in, um, particularly in sort of middle-class haunts of cafes and things like that, and you see all these products of these intensive parenting, gentle yeah. parenting. They're monsters. <laughs> They're absolute monsters. So we're doing, this is wrong. The NHS doesn't know how to raise your kids better yeah. than you do. You know very well. Ella Whelan, thanks so much for joining me. And coming up on Free Speech Nation, I'm going to be speaking to sculptor Sabin Howard. His amazing World War I memorial is going to be unveiled in Washington, D.C. later this year. We're going to be talking all about that. Please don't go anywhere. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office. We hold on to rather unsettled weather across the UK during the week ahead. Further spells of rain in most areas and often quite windy too. Storm Kathleen starting to move away towards the north and uh, northeast of the UK now, but notice low pressure gathering once again towards the southwest, and it's this that will bring further wet and windy weather over the next couple of days. 
Back to the detail for this evening and overnight, and it's a fairly quiet picture for many areas, at least for a time, because notice there's uh, more wet weather coming in across the southwest of the UK into parts of Wales, and the very blustery showers we've seen recently up towards the northwest will gradually ease into the early hours. Temperatures dipping down to mid single figures towards the north under the clearest spells overnight, but uh, starting to rise tonight as the cloud and rain comes up from the south and southwest. There'll be some bright weather around tomorrow across some of the eastern areas during the morning, but a showery burst of rain already gathering down towards the south and southwest, becoming more widespread across England and Wales into the afternoon, and some of those turning quite heavy. Northern Ireland, after a bright start, will see some rain in the afternoon, so it's Scotland that's set to see the best of the weather, here plenty of sunshine, and feeling pleasant enough in light winds, with temperatures up to about 12 degrees. Tuesday looks like being a very unsettled day across all areas. We have warnings in force for wind and rain, wettest weather, they're likely towards the northeast of the UK, and the windiest conditions generally down towards the south and southwest. But wherever you are, a pretty blustery and wet day to come, and it stays quite unsettled during the week ahead, perhaps a bit warmer and a bit drier come Thursday. But generally speaking, very unsettled. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Me, Andrew Doyle. A new World War I memorial is due to be installed in Washington, D.C. later this year. A Soldier's Journey will be America's first national memorial to those U.S. servicemen who lost their lives in the First World War. American sculptor Sabin Howard and the pa Pangolin Foundry in Stroud have taken 10 years to create the life-size battle scene, which depicts 38 figures. And to tell me more, I am joined now by the master sculptor himself. Sabin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on today. Really appreciate you coming on. Congratulations on the piece. It is utterly spectacular. I'm very much looking forward uh, to seeing it in the flesh. Can you tell us about the genesis of this project? Where did it begin? Uh, so this was a global team that ran in 2015. There were 350 uh, design teams that entered, and we, we won this project. And um, from there, then I had to go through government agency approval and uh, after that aspect, we have to figure out how to do this uh, in a very short amount of time. Could you turn me up years. a bit? Can you hear me all right? Uh, yes, I'm just hearing you now. Uh, sorry, Sabin. So um, y you've created this piece. Can you tell us a little? And it's obviously depicting soldiers uh, through the through the war and, and what they went through. Uh, do you have a particular uh, approach to this kind of thing? What is it that you were trying to convey through these depictions? Yeah, uh, it, you know, here's the thing. You get a giant project like this, and there's all these people that are jumping out. All of a sudden, everyone is a sculpture expert. And I had to hold on to my vision, which is very much based on the Renaissance idea that we are sculpting humanity. And from that perspective, I took the way that I worked, which was working from a life model and then translating that into sculpture, uh, I went out and got uh, actors, and I dressed them up in um, real uniforms, actual uniforms. We found photographs in some of those uniforms of the people's family. Uh, I took 12,000 images, and I ended up doing 18 iterations 
Um, from that last iteration, we came up with A Soldier's Journey. So this is a story, really, about a father. That father is an allegory for the United States. Uh, it is also um, a soldier. And it, it's the hero's journey, where someone leaves home. So in this case, he left his, leaves his family behind, enters into the Brotherhood of Arms, um, and then leads a battle. And then from that battle becomes, uh, he, he's shell-shocked. And from that, that's the focus of the whole composition. Um, and then he returns home at the very end, handing his daughter his helmet. And that, that daughter and that helmet are a representation of World War II. So I, I think what was really important to do was make a project that an eighth grader could understand and would also be very exciting. Because look, let's face it, art has taken a beating. It's, it's, there's, there's no sense of value and sacredness anymore. And my sense was like, you need to do something really that elevates human spirit, talks about rising to the occasion, and forget about victimization. This is about a, a sculpture about empowerment. Um, I ended up using real military men, people that had been in battle. I used six veterans as models. Those models are on that bronze relief. So they will be immortalized forever. Their expressions show what it is to be a soldier and to do something that is, it's, it's daunting to, to enter into combat and then return home. I think a lot of people will be looking at that sculpture and thinking, wow, this does not look like your typical modern art piece. I think there's something in the modern art world where conceptual art, the idea of, uh, of something that doesn't raise us to the levels of the numinous, you know, doesn't sort of elevate the human spirit, that almost that kind of approach is, is mistrusted and seen as a bit outdated. I mean, do, do you think I'm right about that? Yeah, I think you're spot on when you say that. I think it's, there's been a real effort to decimate anything of value or something that's sacred. Not, you know, forget about doing a story about human beings. It's not even part of the present narrative of what the art world can do. So this is a very rebellious act on my part. It's, it's meant to change the direction of art. And we've been going on around 100 years now, since World War I, where there was this decimation of how man perceived himself. If prior to World War I, there was a divine order. There was a sense of God. And all of a sudden, you know, 22 million people are decimated. Of course, we're going to get a different a view of, like, you know, us. It's one of alienation. It's where modernism actually starts. So we're coming full circle on this project. I'm taking it back to 100 years ago, when the war, just before the war, and I'm making something that has the great sense of unity here. Okay, we got 38 figures, but mind you, this is one sculpture. That sculpture speaks from 100 feet away or five feet away. There's an intimacy to it when you look at those human beings, and when you move back, you see the whole story unfold from left to right. And uh, you, that, that's not something that's going on today in the art world. It's very interesting that, uh, I mean, when I see pieces of work like this, I think the word that springs to my mind is awe. You know, when you go into the Sistine Chapel, when you go to the Parthenon, I was recently at the Cathedral in Seville, and you see the artworks there, and, and you get filled with a sense of awe and wonder and the capability of, of, of humankind when it comes to art. Uh, and that seems to be something that, do you, I mean, are you suggesting we might be able to reclaim uh, that kind of thing? Well, so why, why wouldn't we? It's like, it, 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 you're saying it exactly the way I would say it. Art represents us. How do we want to be represented? I, I don't really want to be represented by a bunch of cinder blocks on the ground on the floor. I want to be represented by something that's, you know, really amazing. It's all inspiring. And I really like that you bring up Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. Uh, it played a really big part in, in me getting a clear head about what I should do. So in my studio, in my studio, I have a, um, in the bathroom area, I have a poster of the Sistine Chapel, the, at the Last Judgment, actually. And in the beginning of the project, everybody's saying, okay, we want more barbed wire. We want more horses. We want more men running over the top. We want more biplanes. And my head's, you know, it's about to explode. I have smoke coming out my ears. And, and, and so I, I go look at this poster. And I hear in my head, do what you know. And I looked at that poster, it's like humanity, it all pretzeled together, advancing and receding in space. Every one of us will meet our maker, you know? 
And, and I looked at that poster and I said, I'm going to do that with the World War I Memorial. So the World War I Memorial is the interdigitation of all these figures, all showing the different emotions that run and course through human beings, from heroism to fear to sadness. You know, all these things are things that are intangible, and I have made them physically present in reality in a bronze sculpture to explain who we are 100 years ago. But the beauty is, and it's not really a beautiful thing when you think about it, these wars continue on. The war to end all wars is really, it hasn't ended. And so you have veterans now that will come to this in our country, Afghanistan, Iraq, you know, some from the Korean War and Vietnam War, and they will see their story within this. Because it's a historical piece, don't get me wrong on that. They're wearing the uniforms of those World War I soldiers. But a, any soldier, even one from the UK and Britain, who comes to see this piece will recognize his story within it. And I think that's really important, to connect with human beings. And finally, if you could just tell us about where it's going to be unveil, uh, unveiled and, and when. All right. So then this is um, on September 13th of this year. Um, I, would, I, I will be unveiling. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a candlelit vigil. Um, I expect a lot of veterans to show up for that vigil. The sun sets at 719 that night. And it is at Pershing Park, which is 150 yards away from the White House. And this is a moment that we will recognize the soldiers that have fought and given of themselves physically and mentally. Many of them come back, you know, not, not whole. And this is a way to give back to a service that is truly sacred, because there is no, there's nothing more noble than to give of oneself for one country. And I, I just want to mention here, the biggest thing that I learned through this project was to be in service of something larger than oneself is what gives you empowerment. It gives you the sense to proceed forward because you are not just relying on your own ego and your own self. And this is a value that extends back in history. So I'm playing forward history and I'm saying Western civilization does have a role in proceeding forward. It is about us. Why would we cancel that? That's inspiring stuff. Sabine Howard, congratulations and thanks very much for joining me. My pleasure. And next on Free Speech Nation, Owen Jones puts his foot in it again, and a guest on Antiques Roadshow gets more than she bargained for. It's almost time for Social Sensations. Don't go anywhere. Britain's Newsroom. Weekday mornings from 9.30. It's a remarkable story, isn't it? Amazing. Extraordinary. And also, she was unflappable, apparently, yeah. the Princess Royal. She just brilliant. refused to get out of the car and said, I'm not going anywhere. Extraordinary. Well, Jim Beaton was awarded the George Cross for protecting the princess and delighted to say, joins us now, along with the former head of Royal Royalty Protection, Di Davis. Jim, you won't remember, but I met you some time ago at the Imperial War Museum when Princess Anne was opening an exhibition to do with the George Cross and you were there reunited with her, um, and you told me then what great admiration you had for the princess, cool under fire, but you didn't do so badly yourself. It was probably my job, and also um, I had a wee bit of police training, not very much, but a little bit, uh, whereas uh, Princess Anne had nothing, and yet the way she displayed it, you would have thought she'd been uh, highly trained to... Um, deal with any type of that situation. Even though you'd had some training, you took three bullets for the princess. You effectively stood between her and a deranged gunman. Well, I was supposed to be a protection officer, really, so um, I just tried to fuddle about. You must remember that back in 1974, there was no communication, and we were extremely lucky that Michael Hill's who was outside Clarence House and nearby, had got one of the fast police radios, um, or radios on his shoulder, so he was able to send a message out. Otherwise, we would have just been relying on the good old public to phone in and say there was something happening. Yeah, it so means... times have changed drastically.
Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Welcome back to Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. It's time for Social Sensations. That's the part of the show where we look at what's been going viral this week on social media. So first up, political commentator Owen Jones sparked plenty of anger this week online when he was discussing arms sales to Israel and he suggested the Germans were making Palestinians pay due to their own guilt over the Holocaust. Let's have a look. Now, you're right, Britain doesn't supply that many arms, but if it ends arms sales, that then puts huge pressure on Germany, which has decided to make the Palestinian people pay for the grievous crimes it committed by oh, attempting to exterminate on, the, Germ uh, the Jewish people. Come on, have some distance um, And Germany has decided it can make up for its obscene guilt by forcing obscene somebody else guilt. to pay for the crimes that obscene Germany committed. Guilt, it's a very straightforward wow. point. There's nothing offensive about it, is it? This is something I've noticed with Owen Jones. He has this tendency to mind read. He, he has this idea that he understands what everyone's secret motivation is, including whole governments. It's a real flaw in, in it, pretty much everything he does. Yeah, I, I, I suspect it's some kind of projection. So, what's he guilty about? I don't, he's seeing his well, own that's not, values. That's the thing that he does. <laughs> well, I'm not, I can't be specific, but I, you know, he's. Yes, fair enough. But, but what a bizarre thing to say. Yeah, absolutely. And isn't it rather offensive? So on brand. Yeah, there's nothing more powerful than a made-up story, is there, to try and make <laughs> your point? I mean, the, the whole thing that he said assumes that all Germans, by the way, were Nazis, which is not true either. So it's collectively the, the modern Germans are responsible, so they're feeling that guilt. I mean, all of his premises, all of the premises of the people that sit that far on the left are that you must hold the guilt from the past. You must, you must, you must. Uh, you know, we all must hold guilt from the slave trade. And, etc etc it's Owen Jones can only remain relevant all the time that guilt's there as soon as that guilt goes as soon as we all wake up and go do you know what that was the past this is not what's happening now you can make up as much as you like but we're going to dismiss it and we're going to move forward wouldn't it be just helpful to avoid holocaust comparisons when it comes to the current conflict? Well, yeah they haven't done other people much good have they uh... well it feels like it's it's minimizing what went on you know, by bringing it in when it's not really relevant. Yeah, it's it's just invoking it. It's like trying to be dramatic. It's not it's not appropriate. I mean, uh, what's going on in Palestine is, is is a war. It's not ethnic cleansing. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, anyway, yeah. let's move on to something now uh, a bit lighter. This is a lady who innocently took a bangle along to be valued by the Antiques Roadshow crew last week. Not one of the band, it was an item. <laughs> and got more than she bargained for when expert Ronnie Archer Morgan realised it had links to the slave trade. Let's watch this. Ivory bangle here. It's not about trading in ivory. It's about trading in human life. Yes. And it's probably one of the most difficult things that I've ever had to talk about. I just don't want to value it. I do not want to put a price on something that signifies such an awful business. And I just love you for bringing it to the roadshow and thank you so much for making me so sad. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's right. Slavery was abhorrent and terribly sad. But should he have valued the, the bracelet? He could have done. I mean, he was making a point. He now, wasn't berating her, though. To no, he did her. say to her, thank, for, thank yeah. you for bringing it along and making me cry, which was uh, weird. Um, I can understand it. Right, uh, you know, it, it could be it could be classed as virtue signalling. However, uh, it the connotations. I mean, it's the bracelet as well. These things were used to bound people. Yeah, they're horrible. Yeah. So, the, so, however, I would imagine a lot of things that come onto the Antiques Roadshow do have a link to something nasty. 
I imagine they do. I mean, Great most point. historical artefacts are probably, you know... I'd be very surprised if they didn't have some problematic links. But, you know, I've no reason to doubt the strength of his feeling on that. No, mm. absolutely not. And to be fair to the programme, they, they aired it, they did the object... They didn't say, we can't possibly discuss it. Yeah. They had the conversation. Great. Yep. All right, well, look, we've just got time to look through your unfiltered dilemmas. I really appreciate you emailing in every week with your problems. And our first dilemma comes in from Mary. And Mary says, what the hell? My sister has added her boyfriend to the family WhatsApp group and she's only been seeing him for four months. Is this too early? Now I don't even have somewhere to complain about it. It's definitely, I think, a family, <laughs> a family <laughs> WhatsApp group has to be private so we can complain about spouses, partners, yeah. that kind of friends. No, you know, no, no. Come on. Mary doesn't understand how WhatsApp works. Now you just start another group that he's not in. That's how it works. Oh, it's but always then evolving. Then, you, then it's deception. Yes. Well, obviously, it's involving families. What but also, you... isn't this... This person is, is being pushy, he's sort of saying, no, no, he's part of the family now, yeah. right? That's that's the implication here. She, he, she, she, to get her own back, should have introduced him to the group yes. as a new loan signing. Right. So that he, he is, he is he's a new signing and he's likely to be here for about three months. Yes. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then she could have gone, you know, well, welcome to my sister's latest boyfriend. We look forward to well, him being around for about six Paul, weeks. very quickly, we'll have a, a quick dilemma from Rachel. Rachel says, I was due to be a bridesmaid at a friend's wedding, but she complained I was not showing enough enthusiasm to the point where she phased me out totally and I didn't even get an invite. Uh, I'm seeing her next weekend. How should I play it? Yeah, but this idea that you have to do this performative enthusiasm about a wedding. Weddings are boring, you know? Like, honestly, why should you bother? <laughs> nice dress. I don't know. Nice um, dress. I think she's, she's dodged a bullet there. Well, yeah, it sounds like... Every, I don't know what she's complaining about. She's had lack of enthusiasm. My mates let her go. Fine. Yeah. They're still friends. Don't you find that? People getting married, they expect you to be all over. If well, she wanted well, to be well, part well, of it... Anyone she should do it. She should have shown the enthusiasm to be part of it. We've all right. got to pretend, haven't we? Yeah. You know, I mean, the idea of being a bridesmaid... It, it's never happened for me, Andrew. No. And to be honest, if if they're still looking for one, I will do it. Will you? Yeah. It's 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 part well, of my it's part of, it's on my bucket list. I want to be a bridesmaid. Make okay. it happen. There, okay. On that note, thank you for joining us for Free Speech Nation. This was the week when the Scottish hate crime law came into effect. The writers of a Roald Dahl follow-up found themselves in hot water, and free speech came under attack in Brazil. Thanks to my panel, Cressida Wetton and Paul Cox, to all my guests. If you want to join us live in the studio, be part of the audience. Just go to www sroaudiences.com Mark Dolan's up tonight and Headliners is on at 11 o'clock featuring Paul and Cressida Thanks so much for joining me, see you next week That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers Sponsors of Weather on GB News Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office. We hold on to rather unsettled weather across the UK during the week ahead. Further spells of rain in most areas and often quite windy too. Storm Kathleen started to move away towards the north and uh, northeast of the UK now, but notice low pressure gathering once again towards the southwest, and it's this that will bring further wet and windy weather over the next couple of days. Back to the detail for this evening and overnight, and it's a fairly quiet picture for many areas, at least for a time, because notice there's uh, more wet weather coming in across the southwest of the UK into parts of Wales, and the very blustery showers we've seen recently up towards the northwest will gradually ease into the early hours. Temperatures dipping down to mid single figures towards the north under the clearest spells overnight, but uh, starting to rise tonight as the cloud and rain comes up from the south and southwest. There'll be some bright weather around tomorrow across some of the eastern areas during the morning, but a showery burst of rain already gathering down towards the south and southwest, becoming more widespread across England and Wales into the afternoon, and some of those turning quite heavy. Northern Ireland, after a bright start, will see some rain in the afternoon, so it's Scotland that's set to see the best of the weather, here plenty of sunshine, and feeling pleasant enough in light winds, with temperatures up to about 12 degrees. Tuesday looks like being a very unsettled day across all areas. We have warnings in force for wind and rain. Wettest weather, they're likely towards the northeast of the UK, and the windiest conditions generally down towards the south and southwest. But wherever you are, a pretty blustery and wet day to come, and it stays quite unsettled during the week ahead, perhaps a bit warmer and a bit drier come Thursday. But generally speaking, very unsettled. Looks like things are heating up. Box spoilers, sponsors of weather on GB News.
could win our biggest prize giveaway so far. First, there's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. For a chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made my argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take.